Uh, so we're going to be looking at Psalm 37, as Keith mentioned. And Psalm 37 deals with a theme that you find repeated throughout the wisdom literature. You find it in Ecclesiastes, you find it in the book of Proverbs, you find it in the book of Psalms. And it's this issue of the question is, how does a, a, a follower of God, or in our context, how does a follower of Jesus Christ deal with the fact that wicked people prosper? Uh, all around us we see people who are not following God doing, doing well, sometimes doing very well. And, and, in our, and we, we look at our own lives and we see our, our attempts to, to walk faithfully with God. And sometimes we're not, at least in, in some ways, we're not as uh, rewarded in the short term. And so, so the question is, there, there are times when we are tempted to think that it does not pay to follow Christ. And so how do we, how do we cope with that? And how, do we, how, how does the Bible address that tension that we all feel, if you haven't felt it, you will feel it at some point in your life. Okay, so we're going to start out by reading the text. So Psalm 37, beginning in verse 1, says, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more, and you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. So the big idea, really, of this uh, text is that God's people should resist anxiety and despair by continuing to trust him, even when it doesn't appear to make sense, even when it doesn't appear to pay. And the Lord will ultimately vindicate their decision and reward their faithfulness. Now you'll see, if you look in your Bible under the title, Psalm 37, it says that it's a psalm of David. Now David was uniquely qualified to speak to this issue. And I think the best way for you to understand the context of Psalm 37 is to understand the life of David. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, there's a story of David going out to David was what what was his occupation when we first when we first introduced to him in the Bible. He's a shepherd boy. He's 15 years old and he's out watching his father's sheep. Israel is at war with the Philistines and so all of his older Brothers are old enough for military service. They're all out at the front lines. And so David just gets sent out one day on an errand to go visit his brothers, take them to their lunch, see how they're doing. So he shows up, and it turns out that the Philistines have issued a challenge to Israel. And they have, they have uh, said, I tell you what, we, we will spare a lot of lives, and we'll just send out one warrior, our champion. His name's Goliath. And you send us out your best warrior to fight him. And if Goliath wins, the Philistines will take all the land. If your guy wins, you can have all the land. We'll, we'll settle, it, settle it easily, one, one on one. But Goliath was a pretty big old boy. And there was nobody in Israel who wanted to take him on hand to hand. And so David shows up and he hears the things that Goliath is saying and the way that he's taunting the armies of God. And he, he's appalled. He says, why, he kind of shames these guys. He says, why would you let this guy talk to the armies of the living God this way? Don't you know that he'll fight for you? And so anyway, you know the rest of the story. David gets his sling, gets his stones, he goes down, makes short work of Goliath. After, after David does this, it says when he's coming in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, verse, beginning in verse 6, it happened as they were coming 
when David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet the king, who was King Saul. And they met him with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. You like that? That's a good song, isn't it, King? King Saul? Yeah. Come on, everybody. But Saul, Saul didn't want to sing that song. It says, then Saul became very angry. For this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David tens of thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And now Saul, a little backstory of Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, but he turned out to be a weak and wicked king. And so God rejected him as being king. And he chose David to be his replacement when David was 15 years old. So, so that's the backstory. David is going to be the replacement of this wicked King Saul. And uh, after this, this uh, encounter with Goliath, David is the, the love of the ladies in the land. And Saul becomes extremely jealous. And from that day on, David has a target on his back. Saul, he's, he's serving in the palace Saul's throwing spears at him. David's having to, to run for his life over and over and over again. And this goes on for like 15 years. He has to flee the palace. He's running around in the wilderness. And, and Saul is trying to kill him any way he can. He tries to do it personally. He tries to do it by making, he makes David the commander over his armies. And he doesn't do it because he wants to honor David. He does it because he wants, he wants him to be a target for the Philistines. He says, I, the hand of the Philistines will be against him. I won't have to kill him myself. Um, but God preserves and protects David. One more little story is in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. Now, this is while David is out in the wilderness. He's hiding in caves because Saul is seeking his life. It says, now when Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, saying, behold, David is in the wilderness. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel, and he went to seek David and his men in front of the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So he had to use the bathroom. He goes into a cave. And he doesn't know it, but David and his men are sitting further back in the cave. They're in the deeper recesses of the cave. The men of David said to him, Whoa! They said, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. Verse 6 says, He said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord the King, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David persuaded his men with these words, and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. Goes in, does his business, leaves without ever, ever realizing that his life has been in jeopardy. Now afterward, David arose and went out of the cave and called after King Saul, saying, My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men, saying, Behold, David seeks to harm you? Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you into my hand in the cave. And some said to kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. In that moment, David chose to trust God with his future. Although he was persecuted and harassed and chased, he chose that he was going to trust his future to God and not take matters into his own hands. And David didn't know at that time, he didn't know how long he was going to have to be on the run. I mean, in that moment, most of us probably would have justified killing Saul just by the simple fact that he tried to kill me. He tried to kill me, so I'll kill him. But David says, it doesn't matter that he tried to kill me. I'm not. David, on the basis of biblical conviction, he chose to let Saul live and to trust his future to God to trust the promises of God. So that kind of gives you the background, and I hope you can see from that that David is uniquely, uh, especially qualified to speak to us this issue about how to cope when you see someone who is unworthy 
of the honor that's been given them. They don't deserve the wealth that they have. They don't deserve the status, the power that they have. And yet God has given it to them. How do you, how do you cope with that? So this is a psalm of David, a psalm written in David's old age, verse 25. Uh, he mentions that I have been young and now I'm old. And so this is a psalm that David wrote in his old age. If you read uh, Proverbs 24, 19, you'll see that Solomon, David's son, borrowed verse 1 from this psalm to, uh, for, for his own book of wisdom. And so Psalm 37 tells us to fret not because of evil doers. Charles Spurgeon, I think he captured the essence of this psalm with three words. He said, faith cures fretting. Faith cures fretting. And I think that's a great, a great start at an outline for this psalm. Before we can talk about how, how we can cope with the prosperity of the wicked, we need to define some terms. And so first we need to define the problem. He gives us a warning, don't fret yourself. Psalm 37 is a wisdom psalm. Wisdom literature in general is written with usually a couple of purposes. One, to warn God's people how to avoid the the pitfalls of of ungodly living, and secondly, to give them instruction in godly living. Psalm 37 gives us both. And so first we have a warning. It says, don't fret yourself. And you see this three times in these first 11 verses that we're looking at. It says, do not fret because of evildoers in verse 1. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. And then over in verses 7 and 8 it says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. So what is fretting? I thought about this and I tried to come up with a definition that would, that would give us some precision. So fretting is an obsessive fixation. could be on a past event. could be on a present circumstance. It produces anxiety. It produces anger. It produces a compulsive desire to try to control the future. It's what Jesus, in in Matthew chapter 6, it's what Jesus calls worry. The Hebrew word that's used here for to fret means to heat up or to warm up. And so literally, uh, in this form, it's a reflexive form that means don't heat yourself up over evildoers. Don't get yourself worked up. Don't get hot about it. And this happens when we, when we relive wrongs. I think one of, the, one of the best tests for whether or not you're a worrier, whether or not you're a fretter, is to uh, think about what is it that you think about when you're not thinking about anything. When you have time and you fall into your daydream land, are you, do you have a film reel running in your mind of the wrongs that have been done against you, things that somebody did that they shouldn't have done? something that somebody got that you're, you're jealous of, that they, you feel like they didn't deserve. As we, as we have these reflections or even what I would call reliving the moment, we relive it over and over, gets us furious. And then verse 8 says that this fretting, this, this reliving the moment over and over, getting ourselves worked up, he said it leads to sinful behavior. You know, if David, if David had fretted obsessively about his situation with King Saul... His mindset would have been exactly what that of his men was. Kill him. This is your opportunity. It's clear that God is giving you this opportunity that you can have the throne. You can have the wealth. You can have the power. And David, you deserve it. God said you deserve it, right? He said you're, his, you're the one that he chose. And Saul, Saul doesn't deserve it. Take him out. So David would have easily justified that action to murder Saul. Obsessing over... The wrongs of others will lead us to do the very things we hate. We will find ourselves lying to the liars. We will find ourselves gossiping about gossips. We will find ourselves cheating on the cheaters. You you will be the very thing you hate when you allow yourself, when you allow worry to overtake you, when you fret over the wrongs of others. And so what's the solution? David says that the solution is to trust in the Lord. The way that Spurgeon framed it was that the solution is faith. And that's the way that we're going to think about it. Because David, in Psalm 37, he piles up these verbs. And this is kind of how, how Hebrew poetry works. They, they'll pile up verbs to, to 
magnify the point. So in verse uh, chapter or verse three, he says, "Trust in the Lord and do good." Verse four, he says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart." Verse five, "Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He will do it." Verse seven, "Rest in the Lord." And so they're over and over different different ways of saying it, but they're all the same idea that you need to trust God. You don't need to be running about frantically, whether that's physically or whether that's just mentally in your mind. Have you ever been there when you're so obsessed with something that your mind is just frantic and running fast and you can't seem to calm it down? It says you need to just rest. And you just need to trust God. But what is faith? So for the sake of definition, faith is a gift from God that empowers believers to trust God with our past events, present circumstances, and to release our need to control the future. So we don't have to connive. We don't have to manipulate. We don't have to constantly be sitting around thinking about how we can anticipate the next thing that that person's going to do because I know they're going to do something, right? Because that's how we think. We're always, we're always plotting and counterplotting when we're fretting. So David's faith, obviously in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, David's faith was expressed by not taking vengeance on Saul. When, when we might have felt he was justified to do so on his biblical convictions of understanding his, out of his respect and honor for the Lord God who had chosen Saul. He said, I'm not going to do it. I would, rather, I would rather be on the run than to have a tainted conscience before my God. That's a big conviction, and that's one that we all need to cultivate. And it's really what this, what this psalm is about. And so, so fretting's the problem, this, this obsessive uh, anxiety over things that have been done to us or the circumstances around us, our fears about the future. And the solution is faith, this ability to really rest, to really trust, and to release our past, our present, and our future to God and to trust him with it and to know that he'll do what's right. And so that brings us to our application, and I've broken this up into three, three ideas. So how, how is it that faith cures fretting. Faith cures fretting by causing us to refocus our vision on a long view of human history. One of the reasons that we fret is because our vision is too short-sighted. We don't see what God sees far out. Secondly, faith cures fretting by causing us to redefine our definition of prosperity. We often fret because our definition of prosperity is too narrow. We think about it in terms of the material only. Third, faith cures fretting by causing us to remember our faithful Lord who directs human destiny. And that third point is the majority of the, the content of Psalm 37, 40 verses. The majority of those verses deal with this third point, that God is faithful, that he will judge the wicked, and you can, you can rest assured that there's no sin ever committed that's not going to be accounted for. And secondly, that God is going to reward the righteous. Those who trust in him, those who faithfully wait on him, they will be fully rewarded. And so we're going to kind of go through these. Uh, So refocus. Trusting God when times are tough is wise because things won't always be this way. We have this tendency to get trapped in uh, what I call the eternal present or the eternal now. When, thing, when, when times are tough, things are not going the way we want them to, we, we have this tendency to believe that the way things are right now is the way things are always going to be. People get divorced because they believe that the way things are right now is the way things are always going to be. This person's never going to change. I've just got to get out of here and start over, right? We run because we believe that the way things are right now are the way things are going to be. But David tells us that, we need to focus on the long view, that the way things are right now is not the way things are always going to be. The one thing that, you, that is certain is change. Things are always going to be changing. Things are always going to be different. You know, David was promised that he would be king. I think about David being anointed as king. Basically, immediately after he was anointed, Saul started trying to kill him. And this went on for 15 years David, David had no way of knowing that, that that was ever going to end, right, other than believing the promise of God. He didn't know when it was going to end. He didn't know how it was going to end. He just had to trust. 
that God understood the long view. You can see um, verse 25 of chapter 37. But David writing to us now as an old man, right, a guy who's, who's lived a lot of life, he saw the end of the story. He walked through that situation with Saul, and he saw how it ended. Now he, he writes to us, and he says, you know what, I've been young, and now I'm old. He says, but I'll tell you what I've never seen. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. And then in verse 35, he says, I'll tell you something else that I've seen. I've seen a wicked, violent man spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. It's kind of a weird image for the 21st century, isn't it? But (laughs) but a tree with, with abundant root system going down, he says, like a luxuriant tree in its native soil. But then he passed away, and behold, he was no more. I sought for him, but he could not be found. So he says, I've seen, I've seen in my many years, I've seen that the righteous are never forsaken. And I've seen that, that the wicked may prosper for a season. But believe me, it's only a season. When the wicked man goes away, he says, you can look for him, but you're not going to find him. He's, he conveys this idea of complete desolation. You won't be able to, you won't be able to, there will be no mark of him anymore. So the promises of God for the righteous are everlasting and the promises for the wicked are everlasting so he says so he says the wicked won't always prosper the righteous won't always suffer and as you read through psalm 37 you'll find that idea repeated over and over again that the the wicked man disappears like grass goes away verses 12 and 13 i want to point out to you he says the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth and he says the lord's response is to laugh at him. It says the Lord laughs at him. And why does he laugh at him? Because he sees his day coming. Because God has the long view. God knows what the end of the wicked is going to be. It says the wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy to slay those who are upright in conduct. Verse 15 says their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. Again, that's some... That's some uh, not, not 21st century imagery, but you get the idea that he's saying that their, their prosperity is temporary and that their plotting is going to come back on their own head, and you can, you can bet on it. James 1.9 affirms the same idea. It says, The brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. So he says, The brother, meaning the Christian, the follower of Christ, if you're in humble circumstances, you can glory that you've got a high position. Right, Ephesians 2 says that we've been raised up with Christ and we've been given every blessing in the heavenly places. It says, but the rich man, and this means the rich man who puts his hope in his riches and doesn't trust God. It doesn't mean rich men, all rich people. It just means the rich person who puts their hope in their riches and not God says he can glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away for, for the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off. And the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. This truth, it may be hard for us to believe when, because especially in our culture where we're so, the media is so saturated with image, images of people prospering from wickedness, right? Whether it's, whether it's rappers glorifying violence and sex and drugs, getting, getting rich, or whether it's even some, some, Wealthy people, like the wealthiest man in Hungary is a pornographer. And so there are people who are doing wicked things, and they are prospering from it. And so it's hard for us in the moment, if 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 we take the short view, it's hard for us to believe that God's got our back. But the promise of the psalm is that their prosperity is brief, and their misery is going to be long. You should look at Luke chapter 16. Um, has a great story, the rich man of Lazarus, which is kind of Lazarus, which is intended to illustrate that point. We can ask God for this perspective. We can we can ask God, will you help me see things the way that you see them? That's a prayer that I've prayed many many times, uh, and I've never been swept up in a visionary experience where God gave me a vision of the future and said, "Yeah, don't worry about that, Mike, because this is how it's going to turn out." <laughs> right? But many many times. God has given me a peace and a calm and a certainty that he's in control. Yeah. 
and that everything's going to be just fine. Visionary experiences may not be the normal Christian life, but the peace of God that passes human understanding is the normal Christian life. He offers it to you every day. Okay, sorry, we've got to move. Second, redefine. So trusting God when times are tough is wise because prosperity is more than money. So a lot of times our definition of prosperity is too narrow. We, we, this is what I call reductionistic thinking. We, we view our quality of life in just one or two categories, and Scripture calls us to a much broader view. So in verse 11, it says, The humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity in the New American Standard Version. In the English Standard Version, I think it says great peace or abundant peace. Yeah. Abundant peace. So the Hebrew word behind that prosperity or peace is shalom. Prosperity and peace both fail to really capture the, the full meaning of the, of the idea of shalom. Shalom means wholeness, completeness, soundness. There's nothing lacking in a person's life. So their life is full of joy. Their life is full of harmony. It's full of purpose. It means they're complete in their uh, relationship with God their relationship with people around them, their relationship with themselves. David is saying that the prosperity that God gives is more than material wealth. So if you simply look at the material prosperity of the wicked, you can easily get discouraged if you're only measuring prosperity that way. But, but when's the last time that you met a drug dealer who had great relationships with all the people around him? Right? When's when's the last time that you that you met wicked people who who weren't constantly looking over their shoulder, who weren't constantly in conflict with the people around them? So God calls us to a prosperity that is beyond beyond the material. And uh, again, going back to the long view, we're talking we're looking toward the end when Jesus comes back and makes all things right. Um, so there's 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 going to be no lack. Uh, in the life of believers, ultimately. Matthew six twenty four through 34, uh, I would encourage you to, to look at that passage. I think it's powerful for this particular topic. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. He says, For this reason, I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. And he says this, Is not life more than food, and is not the body more than clothing? He says the birds, they don't sow and they don't reap and they don't gather into barns, and yet they get fed. And the lilies of the field, they don't spin, they don't toil, but they look pretty. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Listen to this, he says, You of little faith. Don't worry then, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. That's a huge point in this passage. He says the Gentiles, and yes, God loves the Gentiles and he loves the Jews, but when Jesus uses it in this context, he's saying those people who have no relationship with God, those people who are separated and far from God, of course they run around worrying about what they're going to eat and what they're going to wear. Of course they do, because they don't have any hope. But you, who are a child of God, you shouldn't have little faith. You shouldn't be worried. You shouldn't be running around. You should be trusting and resting. And he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So he doesn't, doesn't promise you a Rolls Royce. He doesn't promise you a mansion. He promises you that you will be taken care of as you pursue his agenda. We need to remember the God who is faithful and who directs human destinies. Trusting God when times are tough is wise because God is good all the time. And that, again, that's the, the majority of the, the verses in this entire psalm. Uh, focus on that. God's faithfulness to judge the wicked and vindicate the righteous is is the main point. The wicked will never escape the righteous judgment of God, 
and the righteous will never, ever be beyond the grace and goodness of God. And we could uh, walk through walk through the text and see that. He says, as he in verses 3 through 6, he says, Trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is This is another way of saying seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He, listen to this in verse 6. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. When God vindicates the faithful. So who was the most faithful man to ever walk with God? You guys know this one. Jesus, Jesus Christ, the most faithful man ever walked with God. He didn't sin. He completely fulfilled the Father's will, and he, and he died on a cross. And three days later, and this is how the, the authors of the New Testament understand it, is that three days later, God vindicated Jesus. He raised him from the dead. It's true. He, he purchased our redemption. We're, we're saved uh, by grace through faith in him. All that is theologically true, but at at a historical level, God vindicated Jesus. Jesus came and he said, I was sent by God to bring salvation to my people, and they didn't believe him. They said, you're a liar. Let's Let's kill him. And God vindicated him. And through raising him from the dead, God said everything that Jesus claimed about himself was true and right, and he was wise, and you should have listened to him, right? So that, that, that was the point of the resurrection in its historical context. And that's exactly what God promises the faithful in the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the last day when Jesus uh, judges the living and the dead, we are going to be publicly vindicated. The whole world is going to know that those who faithfully followed Christ were doing God's will. That they, they were walking in truth and doing what's right no matter no matter what the world said about us in the moment. So there's this, this vindication that we look forward to, and it's a, it's a public vindication. It's not just a, it's not something that's done in a corner. And so no matter what circumstance you're in today, you're not beyond the grace and goodness of God. By faith, you can have the shalom of Jesus Christ, even while surrounded by wicked people. And when this and I think as I, was, as I was studying for this, I think one of the things that I felt was, you know, when I think about being vindicated in the future, part of me says, God, I don't, I don't want to wait that long. I'd kind of like some vindication now. I'd kind of like some justice now. It would be great. And I think that this is where we have to make a distinction between longing and fretting, right? So when, when Jesus, at the end of Revelation in chapter 22, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And John, the guy who wrote Revelation, he's, when he's writing the Revelation, he's exiled on the island of Patmos. And the church around him is experiencing extreme persecution. So when Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, John's response is, Amen, Lord, come. We're ready. Right? So he was longing, but he wasn't fretting. He wasn't so consumed with the injustice.